I've been a barber for almost 15 years now. My grandpa was a barber, and my fondest memories of him were eating candy in one of his chairs while listening to him shoot the shit with locals. Johnny, I don't just cut hair, he would say, I'm also a therapist, a lawyer, a political advisor, and a professional secret keeper. And every once in a while, he said while taking out a bottle of hair dye, I can temporarily reverse the effects of time. That's what I liked most about my grandpa. People trusted him. They would plop themselves down in his chair and prattle on about anything. I learned about politics, sports, gossip, and even how the mayor of our small town kept his hair jet black. Cutting hair was all I wanted to do. So when he passed, I decided to take over his little shop and carry on the traditions. My family was shocked, as I had previously worked at a high-end, prestigious salon in LA at the time. But deep down, I'm a sentimental sap. You can't put a price on some things. Most of my grandpa's clientele switched to me, and I just picked up where he left off. I didn't change a thing. I kept the faded black and white tile and the worn barber's chair, not wanting to disrupt the comfort of my customers. It was all about the client, after all, and I cherished every experience with them. Except for one. Dwayne Corliss. My grandpa grew up with Dwayne and cut his hair about once a month, which was odd because even back then, he was mostly bald. Even more strange is that my charismatic grandpa didn't say a word to Dwayne while cutting his hair. In fact, he seemed to be uncomfortable while doing it. Dwayne would pay my grandpa in cash and then saunter out of the shop. He always was an oddball, my grandpa said one day while I was sweeping up clumped hair off the floor. He's got a son around your Uncle Nate's age, but I hardly ever see him. I didn't even expect Dwayne Corliss to still be alive. But one fall afternoon, I heard the door chime from the office, and there he was, staring off into space with a slack-jawed gaze. He may have still been breathing, but he was tiny, frail, and looked like he just came out of a bad cold. A few white wisps of hair still clung to his head. Don Jenkins at the Berkshires told me you took over the place, he muttered softly. I'd like a haircut, please. I led Dwayne to the chair and fastened the cutting cape around his wrinkly, wiry neck. He stared at himself in the mirror the whole time, with a grimace on his face. I don't recall him ever blinking. He only moved to signal that he was okay with the job. The whole cut lasted less than five minutes. Dwayne handed me a crumpled $10 bill and then shifted toward the door, maybe I'll see you next month, he mumbled before shuffling outside. I almost felt bad for Dwayne but pushed the thought out of my mind in time for my next customer. I inquired about how he was doing with Steve Robinson, a lawyer who knew just about everyone in town. Dwayne stopped by, huh? Steve began. Yeah, he's been having some health problems. I think his son moved back in with him a while back. Oh yeah, Grandpa mentioned he had a son. What's he like? Yeah. David's his name. He's nice enough, I guess. I remember he was at the community college with my daughter Janine back in the 90s. Then he left town. Dwayne said he got a new job or something. Is he working? Not sure. He's in and out of town a lot, so maybe? I shrugged my shoulders and finished fixing up Steve. A couple weeks rolled, and I forgot about Dwayne Corliss until he returned to the shop precisely one month since I last saw him. This time, I was determined to engage him and reconcile with my grandfather's previous awkwardness. Well, hi, Mr. Corliss. You want the usual? Dwayne smiled softly and sat in the chair. I tried to make conversation and got a couple of words out of him. He was hardly the pariah other folks made him out to be. I began to feel even more guilty but decided to make amends and give Dwayne the best experience possible. He didn't talk much, but I could tell he enjoyed being spoken to. I cut Dwayne's hair for the next five months until one day, he came in looking more sickly than ever. I asked if he was doing okay, but he waved off my concerns. I want you to cut it all off this time, he croaked. I think I want to try being bald for a change. 
It took me less than a minute to shear off the last bits of stubborn white hair that Dwayne kept. He rubbed his almost mummified fingers over his naked head and smiled. Thanks, Johnny. This looks great. I could feel tears welling inside my eyes, somehow knowing this would be the last time I'd see him, Dwayne handed me a $10 bill and walked to the door. Before he would leave, Dwayne would always softly say, see you next month. But this time, he just waved goodbye. Two weeks later, I got a call from Steve Robinson. Hey, Johnny, wanted to call to tell you that Dwayne Corliss passed away. There won't be a service, but I thought you should know. Damn, I replied. He was a good guy, great customer too. I think we may have even become friends. Steve cleared his throat. See, well, that's not exactly what I'm calling about, Johnny. You know, I'm just about everyone's lawyer in this town. I did Dwayne's will, and well, uh, he left you a good chunk of change. I flew to Steve's office in my truck, my mind racing. What in the hell was going on? I hardly knew Dwayne. Why on earth would he leave me something in his will? Steve noticed my confusion when I entered his office and poured me a hefty glass of bourbon before reading Dwayne's will. A man I hardly knew left me $25,000. I gulped down the whiskey, hoping it would calm my nerves, but I could still feel my hands shaking under Steve's desk. There's one thing I need to show you, though, Steve began, and I could sense some discomfort in his voice. He handed me a letter that was scrawled in shaky handwriting. Dear Johnny, I wanted to thank you and Nelson for taking care of me all these years. Since Nelson is gone, I want to leave this gift for you. Hopefully, you can spruce up the shop. My only ask is that you cut my son Davy's hair too. It's always so messy. You get the money either way. This was a suggestion, not a condition. Steve finally spoke after a minute of awkward silence. But something tells me that David needs someone to talk to like his daddy did. Plus, well, I'm not supposed to be telling you this, but Dwayne didn't leave much for his son. Not even close to what he left you and the church. The pit in my stomach turned again, and a pang of sadness washed over me. I nodded, and Steve wrote down the address to Dwayne's house. David should still be there, though I'm not sure if he's in town. I think I have his number somewhere. I floated back to the shop and sat aimlessly in the barber's chair, still taking in everything. I placed a call to the number Steve gave me, but it went straight to voicemail. I left a message for David, expressing my condolences and eagerness to cut his hair. The following afternoon, I heard the bell chime and the shuffling of feet. I walked around the corner and saw a short, scrawny man looking through a magazine in the waiting area. As I approached him, I realized it was David. He looked just like Dwayne, small and razor thin with beady, blue eyes. But unlike his father, David had a head full of thick, sandy blonde hair, albeit a little faded for his age. I extended my hand. You must be David. Please, call me Davy, he replied shaking my hand weakly. His voice was soft and meek like his father's. Davy examined me, and I felt his eyes drifting toward my hair, growing wide in excitement, Dad said you were the best at cutting hair. Can you make mine look like yours? I laughed, genuinely enjoying the compliment. I can make your hair look even better. Davy grinned and hurried over to my chair. Davy wasn't as chatty as some of my other customers, but he certainly talked more than his father. He spent a lot of time traveling for work as a truck driver, but he liked the long hours on the road. We chatted briefly about current events when Davy asked if I had a girlfriend. I told him I did, and he seemed to be slightly disappointed. I'm still looking for the right gal, he said quietly, hoping a new look will help with that. I snipped the top of Davy's hair and was almost surprised at how unhealthy it looked. It felt brittle to the touch, and even his scalp looked splotchier than the rest of his head. After I finished his cut, I pulled out a bottle of conditioner I kept in the back. 
The men in this town are always too concerned about how manly they are, I said while handing Davy the conditioner. But I promise your hair will look healthier if you shower with this. Davy's eyes lit up. Well, I can't believe how great I look now. Can't wait to try this out. I told Davy his haircuts would be on the house in memory of his father. He shook my hand in gratitude and then bolted out of the shop. A couple months went by before he came in for another cut. Hey, Johnny! That conditioner sure did help. Davy exclaimed when he came back into the store. His hair looked even longer than when he previously showed up at my shop. It looked thicker and had a deeper, more vibrant golden blonde color. I smiled and began to cut his hair, chatting with Davy about what was new with him. But I kept getting distracted by how great his hair looked. It looked more textured and felt silky smooth to the touch. It seemed to shimmer even under the dull box light that had been in the shop since the 1970s. Maybe I needed to get back on the conditioner. Davy, I cannot believe how great your hair looks. Especially since your dad was balder than a baby. No offense, of course. None taken. Davy chuckled. They say the baldness comes from your mom's side, after all. But it hasn't looked this good since when I was a kid. I finished the cut and told Davy I would order some matching shampoo for the conditioner. He could pick it up at the store once it came in. It came a couple days later, but Davy's number went straight to voicemail again when I called him. I knew his address, so I just figured I'd drive over and leave it in his mailbox. But the Corliss household didn't have one, so I drove up the gravel road to place the package on his front porch. The door was slightly ajar, and I called out for Davy but was greeted by silence. I left the package on the floor and then turned back to my truck when I heard a soft noise coming from inside. I don't know how to explain it. It was a thumping noise, like a box falling off a counter and onto the floor. I peeked in to see what the commotion was, but the living room was pitch black. I fumbled on the wall beside me for a switch, found one, and turned on the light. I stepped into the house, sinking into the old carpet on the floor. The outdated wood panel walls were littered with family photos, and I stopped to look at them. The first few were of a young Duane and a pretty woman with long blonde hair, who I suspected to be Davy's mom. I found it funny that neither of them ever talked about her. The next couple of photos depicted Davy from when he was a baby to a young man, beaming happily in all of them. His blonde hair was always shaggy and, even in the sepia-colored photos, looked magnificent. I followed the frames chronologically until I stopped at a picture of Davy and Duane at what looked like his high school graduation. The woman was missing from the photo, and Davy and his father looked somber instead of smiling. Davy was holding his graduation cap in his hands, and I was a little confused when I glanced at the top of his head. Like his father, he was already beginning to bald. I heard the thumping noise again, but this time it sounded even louder. Curious, I followed the noise to a room at the end of the hallway. I knocked on the door and called out Davy's name but didn't get a response. This is crazy, I muttered under my breath, but before I could turn around, I heard the thump again. I'm not sure what washed over me, but every time I heard that damn noise, I felt like something was off. I opened the door and almost let out a yelp. Under the bedroom's only window was a long dresser that almost scraped the entryway to the bathroom. On top of the dresser were five decaying mannequin heads. Each head was wearing a wig. I tiptoed to the dresser and studied the wigs. They were all blonde and shorter, except for the first wig, which looked ancient. That one was maybe shoulder length. Despite their disheveled appearance, these wigs looked well-made and expensive. I doubt they were crafted from synthetic hair. The wig at the end looked similar to Davy's hair when he first came to my shop, and I saw the cuts I made with my scissors on the top. Why was Davy having me cut his wigs? Did he want to make the facade look as real as possible? I heard the thump again, deducing that it came from the bathroom. It sounded different though, wet and sloshy, like someone was trying to get out of a bathtub. 
I crept to the bathroom and peered around the side and... Inside the tub was a tied up man. The top of his head was scalped. The man turned to look at me, his eyes grew wide, and he started screaming from the duct tape under his mouth. Blood squirted from the gaping wound, and his eyes rolled into the back of his head. I frantically called 911 and placed a towel over the man to stop the bleeding. When Davy returned home not 10 minutes later, he was greeted by the entire police department. I remember seeing him sheepishly hold his hands up in the front seat of his car as he was swarmed by armed officers. We made eye contact as he was being hauled away. I made it look real, didn't I, Johnny? The new police chief Don Henderson, another of my customers, called me a few days later with some details. The state police came in and found five people's bodies underneath the Corliss household's floorboards. One of those bodies was Davy's mother, who had unknowingly been removed from her resting place in the county cemetery. Dwayne Corliss made several calls to the police over the years but gave up after they never looked into his concerns. Each victim was a man who had blonde hair. Davy confessed to the murders, but Chief Henderson thinks the state police will connect him to at least 10 more. They also found a journal in which Davy laments his hair loss and believes it was why he could never find love. I read the journal in a PDF file, and he spends half of the book blaming his mother. He talks about seeing hitchhikers on the road with blonde hair and goes into detail about his envy of them. The delusions grew more intense as the years went by. Davy began to kill the hitchhikers and scalp them, hoping to create the perfect wig to restore his youth. His latest victim, a missing college student, would have certainly perished had Davy not run out of toupee glue. I closed the shop for two weeks, still unable to comprehend that, for the time being, I was cutting the hair of a dead person on Davy's head. I'm not sure if I'll be able to find the courage to reopen. My office phone is cluttered with unread voicemails inquiring when I'm going to go back to work. I've noticed that one of them is from the county jail. Yesterday, Davy's trial began. I was there in attendance and watched the officers bring Davy out in cuffs. He was bald like his father, minus the scraggly strands of hair hanging off the back of his head. He turned to look at me and grinned. A chill went down my spine. For maybe the first time in my life, I was happy that my hair was brown. Cemetery Road Susan looked up at the sign on the corner of her new street, Cemetery Road. At the end of the block she could see the cemetery row after row of tombstones behind a high iron gate. Susan knew the view well by now. It was the same view she had from her bedroom window. Just a month ago, she'd lived in a pretty house with a view of a park. Then her father had been transferred to this city. And the only house they could afford was on Cemetery Road. Susan's friends had laughed when she gave them her new address. They thought she was joking. Hey, aren't you the new girl, a voice called out from behind her. Susan turned around to see two boys and one girl riding on bicycles. She recognized them from school. They were in some of the same classes with her. Susan nodded her head in answer to their question and kept walking. What's it like living on Cemetery Road? One of the boys asked. Pretty spooky? Susan felt a flush creep into her cheeks. Not at all, she said. I'm not one bit afraid of living here. The girl and the boys kept riding their bikes beside Susan as she walked quickly toward her house. I guess you haven't heard the stories about that cemetery, the girl said. It's haunted by a black cat. Sure, Susan said. Do you expect me to believe that? It's true, the other boy said. There's a big tomb in the middle of the graveyard, it has a statue of a black cat on top of it. What's so scary about that? Susan asked. The cat comes alive at night, the girl said. And haunts the cemetery. I don't believe in things like ghosts, Susan said. I dare you to visit the black cat at night, one of the boys said. Susan glared at them. I wouldn't be afraid to do that. Dare you to take off its collar, the girl said. It has a leather collar around its neck, just like a real cat. Bring that collar to school tomorrow, the other boy said, and you'll prove how brave you are. 
Dare you, the girl taunted. It's a dare, Susan said. She ran away from their mocking faces toward her house. She would show them that she wasn't afraid. But the thought of going into the graveyard at night made her shudder. She had to get the collar this afternoon, before it got too dark out. Susan's house was the second from the end of the road that led into the cemetery. A rickety old house that no one lived in sat right next to the graveyard. Susan pushed open the door to her house, went inside, and threw her books onto the bench in the hallway. Before she could run up to her room to change, her mother rushed into the hallway. She told Susan that they were meeting her father at his office and then going out to dinner. Susan tried to protest, but it did her no good. Ten minutes later, she was driving downtown with her mother, worrying about when she would go to the cemetery. They didn't come home until 10 o'clock that night. Susan went up to her room, put on her pajamas, and nervously stared out the window. The tombstones in the graveyard were bathed in the eerie light of the moon. Susan wondered how she would find the black cat there. Finally her mother came in to say goodnight. Susan lay on her bed, waiting for the house to fall silent. When at last everything was quiet, she looked at the clock. It was 11.38. Susan slipped out of her pajamas and into a t-shirt and jeans. Outside her screen window, the September night was still warm. She picked up the flashlight she used for camping trips and quietly stole down the stairs and out of the house. Susan crept through the darkness past the rickety old house next to the graveyard and then through the arched entrance to the cemetery. She was afraid to use her flashlight in ease someone in a nearby house saw her. The full moon shed enough light on the white gravel path for her to find her way in the dark. Suddenly the stillness in the cemetery was broken by the weird call of a night bird. Susan froze in her steps. Until now, she had not been afraid. But the call reminded her that other things were out there in the night, watching her. She switched on her flashlight and swung it around in a wide circle. The beam lit up the cold, white marble tombstones around her. Susan kept walking toward the middle of the cemetery, where the black cat was to be found. The gravel path sloped upward at a slight angle, and soon she found herself standing on a small hill. From the streetlights around the edge of the cemetery, she could tell she was near the center. Susan shone the beam of the flashlight onto the nearby tombstones. The face of an angel stared back out of the darkness, making her catch her breath in fear. Then she saw it. The black cat was like a dark shadow in the night, crouching on top of a huge, white marble tomb. Susan made her way on trembling legs over to the statue. The night bird shrieked again, sending a chill through her body. She stood underneath the cat and shone her light on it. The animal was made of smooth black marble, except for its eyes, which were of shining green stones. And around its neck, just as the girl had said, was a leather collar. Susan climbed onto a step of the white base and read the inscription etched into the marble, disturbed not the dead for a second, she wanted to turn and run away, as fast as she could, from the tomb and its warning. But there, only inches from her hand, was the collar she had come to get. She set down her flashlight beside the cat and reached both hands around its marble neck to unfasten the collar. She whispered grateful thanks as its buckle eam easily undone. But at that very moment, the bell on a nearby church began to strike the midnight hour. It frightened Susan so that she almost dropped the collar. On the fourth stroke of the bell, Susan picked up her flashlight and shone it into the cat's face. To her horror, the green eyes gleamed back at her like a real cat's. On the eighth stroke of the bell, Susan climbed down from the tombstone and heard a wicked hiss come from the statue. On the twelfth stroke of the bell, Susan ran down the gravel path of the graveyard, her heart in her throat and her mind in a frenzy of fear. The light from the flashlight wavered on the path in front of her as Susan ran away from the black cat. She tried to tell herself that she had imagined the cat's hiss. But then, from behind her, she heard the soft thud of animal paws on the gravel path. And a long, angry hiss sounded through the night air. Susan turned around and saw what she feared. Two big green eyes were following her in the darkness. Finally, Susan reached the entrance to the cemetery. 
she could see her house ahead. It was only yards away now. She ran faster and faster until she reached the front door. With trembling hands she twisted open the knob and ran inside. She shut the door behind her, double locked it, and then ran up the stairs, panting with fear. She slipped into her bedroom and shut the door. From outside her screen window, she could hear a neighbor's dog howling weirdly in the night. Susan looked down at her trembling hands and saw the leather collar. Quickly she went to her dresser, opened the top drawer, and hid the collar inside. Then she put on her pajamas and lay down between the sheets, trembling with exhaustion and fear. Susan stared out her window at the ghostly shapes of the tombstones in the moonlight. She listened to the dog's weird howl. And finally, after a long time, she fell into a fitful sleep. Susan woke with a start. She had been having a terrible nightmare. In the dream, a black cat had been sitting on her chest, hissing down at her. Susan opened her eyes and stared into the darkness of her room. Then she remembered the collar. She switched on her lamp and ran to the dresser. Quickly she pulled out the top drawer. The collar was gone. Then Susan saw the deep claw marks of a eat on the top of the dresser. She whirled around and saw the big ragged hole torn in her window screen. And there, on the windowsill outside, she saw the black cat, staring back at her with glowing green eyes. Just One Kiss is a spooky story about a talking frog. Jane and Lisa were on their way home from school. They lived in the country, and the school bus had just dropped them in the lane that led to their homes. There was a hedge beside the lane, and as they passed a particular bush, they both clearly heard a small voice cry, help. They stopped. Where did that come from? asked Jane. Down here, cried the voice. At the bottom of the hedge. They looked down. Crouching in the undergrowth was a small, green frog. Yes, it was me, said the frog. I can talk? Lisa shook her head to clear it, and Jane pinched herself to see if she was dreaming. But the frog was still there, please, it said, will you help me? I'm human, but I was turned into a frog by an evil sorceress. It hopped forward and gazed up at them with huge, googly eyes. I know it sounds corny, but there's only one way to break the spell, and that's if a girl kisses me. I don't believe this, said Jane. I've gone nuts. Oh, I don't know. Lisa crouched down and stared hard at the frog. Okay, let's just say you're telling the truth. I am, I am, the frog pleaded. All right. Listen. If you're telling the truth, and we kiss you, and you turn back into a human, what's in it for us? The frog blinked. Well. I'm not rich. But I'd give you a hundred pounds. It's all the money I've got. A hundred pounds. Lisa repeated thoughtfully. Hmm, Jane could see her doing some mental arithmetic. And Jane was getting interested now. Just say the frog was on the level? They could buy a lot of things with a hundred pounds. Right, said Lisa. She picked the frog up and put it in her coat pocket. The frog started to protest, but the pocket muffled its cries. Lisa started to walk on. Hey, said Jane. Aren't we going to kiss him? No way? Said Lisa coolly. But a hundred pounds is a lot of money. Sure, said Lisa. But think how much more we can earn with a talking frog. 